I love your shirt. It's oh, thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Um, where are you on in, in North America? I'm in Tucson, Arizona. Oh, okay. Do you guys is is it Arizona that doesn't have daylight savings or? Um, I believe so. I feel like there's a, one of the, um, somewhere in the Southwest, there's one of those states, I'm pretty sure it was Arizona, that at least they didn't used to have um, daylight savings at all. One second. I have never tried to put this on. Someone bought this for me. A, oh like a my mini. God, that's so mini. cute. And I've never taken it out of the... Uh, of the thing, so let's see. I love that. <laughs> That's so cute, it's tiny. Um, so where would you like to start? Um, just tell us a little about, a bit about yourself and kind of your background and how you got into writing. Okay, um, so my name is Bethany Simaro and I'm the author of MEM, which was an adult market um, speculative literary novel that came out in 2018 with Unnamed Press. And I'm also the editor and contributor to a young adult anthology called Take the Mic, Fictional Stories of Everyday Resistance, which came out with Scholastic, I'm sorry. Um, so yes, Bethany C. Morrow, the author of the adult novel Mem, um, editor and contributor to Take the Mic, and my first standalone Young adult novel is A Song Below Water, which is a contemporary fantasy set in modern day Portland, um, in an alternate sort of modern, uh, modern day Portland where there are magical creatures and where only black women are sirens and therefore sirens are now feared and um, suppressed. Um, in terms of how I started writing, I mean, like most people, that's a pretty impossible question because I've always been writing. Um, I have been writing ever since I literally could write. So ever since early elementary school. And um, I sort of, I never studied writing in school. I always had other interests like sociology or clinical psychology. And up until I was in grad school in the United Kingdom, I pretty much, I don't know what I thought, but apparently I assumed well, publishing will just sort of happen on its own. So I'm just going to focus on these other interests that I have. And then around 2005 or 2006, um, I was like, oh, I think I have to actually first thing this. Thanks so much. Um, so I think I sort of have to pursue this um, and learn the industry and just realizing that it, like every other like every other uh, profession has an entire industry behind it um, that you don't really see if all you're looking at is the marketplace and that is something that has to be learned and studied um, to know where your work even belongs and who represents your work and all that sort of stuff and so I started doing that I will say I started doing that most in earnest in 2010 and then I got my first agent and offer of publication in 2015 and ended up parting ways with both of them. And then I signed, um, I sold Mim on my own. And then someone came to me to do Take the Mic. And then I signed with my agent for A Song Below Water, my second agent. Okay. Um, so that kind of leads into my next question of, you have a degree in sociology and you've also studied things as film from the psychology and theater, how does your knowledge in those fields help shape what you're doing now in the writing industry and who are your writing inspirations? I think that for me, I'm always gonna be the type of person because I was writing before all of those things um, and because I am not a person who feels like my identity is shaped by what I do. I am a, a person who feels like um, I am a person who does what I do because of my identity, because of my personality, because of my interests. So sociology was something that I studied because it was the way my brain worked. I didn't understand people trying to psychoanalyze individuals with no sort of understanding of the sociological 
you know, trappings and, and agencies that work in our society, I didn't believe. And, you know, I come from a pretty large sibling set and family. So there's no way that I thought that individual people were born in vacuums. Um, so psychology to me is extremely interesting, but it doesn't make any sense outside of sociology. Uh, it's very theoretical, I should say, without um, a sociological foundation. So I don't, I know people always want you to credit, you know, things that you studied and everything. And I just, that's not the way I see it personally. So I don't really, I don't think that those things have any impact on my writing so much as I was writing about them before I was ever in those programs. Um, and so I had a natural interest and sort of independent study of you know, things like social psychology and especially psychology and things having to do with criminalization and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's what I was interested in in junior high and in high school. Um, I simply hadn't gone to university yet. So um, yeah, I think those are just inherent in a interest that I'm in. I had the things that allowed me to focus on them. So my writing inspirations, again, I don't feel that anyone inspires me to write because it's something that I've always been doing, but the people who, the people who give me rest, the writers who give me something that refill, you know, my tank, um, of course, would be Toni Morrison. Um, and I say that because she was actually the first author um, whose work really, really fed me. And I really felt like this is an affirming experience. This is a person who speaks in a language similar to my own. And obviously I read a lot before I came upon Toni Morrison because I didn't, I didn't discover Toni Morrison until I was about 16 years old. So before that, I was sort of reading for I was reading for the kind of dark weirdness that I like. So I was reading a lot of Lois Duncan and Christopher Pike and um, some Stephen King, but a lot of stuff that was just um, pretty difficult to define in terms of genre. I didn't really read fantasy um, because a lot of fantasy when I was growing up and I never have read epic fantasy, but a lot of the fantasy when I was growing up was very sort of by the numbers. And I didn't like anything that was sort of, and number one, where I could sort of see the engine running with the author. Like I know from reading your work, what you're thinking and what you're trying to accomplish. That to me is not a fun reading experience. Um, it's not immersive enough. So I read a lot of stuff that was really um, undefinable in terms of the genre, a lot of stuff that bled into it, which nowadays I would know that would be really difficult to, um, to come out with those kind of books. And that's sort of what I did with MEM anyway, because it's speculative literary fiction. And the first thing you always have to do is find people who know that that's even a thing. Um, because I submitted it to some people and they really wanted to push toward science fiction. And then I submitted it to others and they really wanted it to go really literary. And so they wanted you to kind of ease back on the speculative um, concept. But um, I wasn't, it wasn't unintentionally speculative literary fiction. So it's very common for me that I have a very high concept, but that my focus in the story and what drives the story are not genre conventions, but rather character um, characterization and character development and the, the journey of the, of the person that I'm focusing on. And I'll tend to focus on a person before I will focus on the world. I'm not interested in the concept or the world because, oh, let's just, let's just look at the world and in a very sort of macro sociological way and think, what are all the implications of this world? The best way to understand a world is to look at a person. Um, because like I said, everybody is a result in some way um, to a great degree of the society that has borne them and that has impressed upon them all of their lives. Um, so it's the same, I think that the similarity between Mem and A Song Below Water, despite the fact that they're completely different categories, completely different genres um, in so much as you can find one for Mem. Um, I think the, the biggest similarity is that the world building that I do is always going to be character specific. Um, I'm not gonna stop in the story and be like, okay, here's what you as the reader might want to know, because I'm not, 
there should be no direct communication between me and the reader, basically. <laughs> um, anything that they learn about this world needs to be based on what is um, relevant to the character in the story. Um, so the character needs to be really strongly a result of the world because they are going to be the way that I introduce the reader to the world and, and sort of um, slowly reveal you know, through a layering kind of process, things are the truth about this world or aspects of this world. I don't know I, if you can hear a cat scratching in the background, sorry. Oh no, you're fine. Um, what I really love about this novel in particular, A Song Below Water, is that it tackles so much and it's so heartfelt and I just, I actually read it twice because I just loved it that much. Um, oh my gosh. And the audiobook is just amazing. The dual Jennifer, narration. Jennifer and, oh gosh, Andrea. I, as soon as I heard their voices, I knew exactly who they were. I, I knew that they were Effie and Tavia. So I was really, really pleased and blessed to have their auditions because I thought that their voices were so perfect for these characters. Yeah, I think it was amazing. Um, your novel tackles misogynoir, sisterly love, and the important fact that Black women deserve so much more than they're given. Um, I wanted to ask you about the title. Um, I saw that it was originally titled The Sound in the Stone, correct? Mm -hmm. um, what impacted this change and what does this new title mean to you? So it's super duper common for titles to change once you sell a book. Um, for me, I required that the title be changed because I kept telling, um, I kept telling my agent and then my editor that this was a placeholder title. This is not at mm. all. Um, the sound and the stone, I always trip over it myself because it sounds like the sword and the stone. Um, it's, it's a very almost epic fantasy type of a title. So I was like, there's no way that I want this actually to be used for the book. I'm sorry. Um, I really should have eaten noodles. I didn't know noodles impacted me this way. Anyway, um, I knew it was a placeholder. I told him I did not want this to be the title. I told him it didn't even reflect the genre properly because this is contemporary fantasy. So in my mind, what I really was hoping for with the title was a conversational title, um, and something that was much more indicative of the social commentary aspect of it, the contemporary aspect of it, because I don't think <clears throat> that you need to sell the fact that it's fantasy. You're going to see that right away. Um, she, you know, one of the characters is immediately identified as a siren. Um, and then the cover, of course, does a very good job of demonstrating that, you know, there's something otherworldly about, about these girls. So, of course, you end up back and forth with sales and um and you know with your editor as sort of the mediator between the two and we actually went through a lot of titles for a song below water and the reason being is number one titles really are important to me and i've usually sort of known what my dream title is but i have never written contemporary fantasy before so i really i had really strong feelings about what i wanted the title to be but they weren't they really didn't touch on the fantasy aspect. They really were more about the characters as black girls. And of course, sales is like, well, you know, we, we want, you know, you want people to, when they hear the title, know what genre this is. They care a lot more about genre than I do. Um, so we went through, gosh, we went through so many. And I will tell you that when we first landed on A Song Below Water, my feeling was just like, sure, fine. Um, <laughs> Just because I had vehemently not liked other stuff. Um, I knew that I wanted, obviously, voice to be a part of it. And I wanted something that my biggest thing was I didn't want people to focus on Tavia as though Tavia was the only main character. And I felt like because hers is the first POV um, and because hers is sort of the concept through which the story even started, I knew that there was a really good chance that people were going to talk about Tavia. And that actually has still happened a little bit. Um, not as bad as it could have been, but it does happen sometimes that people really just talk about Tavia. I wanted the title to be a unifying, like I wanted it to apply to both of them. So the time that you actually see the title sort of alluded to is actually when Effie 
it's the second chapter, which is Effie's first POV chapter, where she's swimming and she's talking about what happens when you go under the water. Um, and obviously, you know, I'm a California kid. I'm, you know, used to swimming a lot. And I really just thought about what happens when, when I go underwater the first time. It's, it really is a completely different soundscape. Um, no matter what's happening above the water, as soon as you go underneath it, there is, and there, and it has its own melody. And really, it's of course the water parting, the bubbles that are, you know, escaping from you, and and then just the sound of water, just the movement and the sound of water. So um, I liked it because it was literal. I liked it because it was fantastical. I liked it because it's almost um, an oxymoron. The if you think about us trying to actually make a sound underwater or make a song specifically underwater. Of course, that's not possible to do without sort of endangering yourself. Um, so it worked, you know, when you thought about it, literally it worked fantastically. Um, and it, like I said, it applied to both girls, even though you don't know what Effie is when you first start. So I, it, I ended up loving it more and more the longer we had it. But I, if I'm being honest, at the very beginning, it was just like, fine, let's stop talking about this. I'm so over this title search. <laughs> um, that's very interesting that like, you went through kind of like the motions of what do we want to do? What will work best? And how I kind of interpret it is like, um, these black girls, they everyone tries to drown out their voice and mm -hmm. still they kind of like find their melody as a siren and as um as just black girls in general to like kind of take charge and become a part of like the movement especially mm -hmm. in portland which is so amazing yeah i think it's um i mean everything that happens makes it even sort of more devastating because obviously this is not new. None of this stuff is new. None of the stuff in the book is new. It feels new to people because they've had the privilege of ignoring it for so long. But to see it escalate the way it is escalated, specifically in Portland, um, just since the book came out is really, you know, I don't think anybody wants that kind of um, advertisement for their book. Uh, because this is happening to real people. This is, um, and, and obviously because my family is there. Um, but it's, yeah, that it just, I can't escape, I can't escape news of Portland right now. I can't escape news of the protests in Portland right now, of the um, kidnappings that are happening in Portland right now. It's, it's uh, sort of uninterpretable, just the, the way that I feel about this book right now because of what's happening. Yeah, I'm, I really hope your family is doing well. I actually did read that um, Portland was a very distinct decision that you place a story there because of the lack of progressiveness and all of the um, experiences you've had there. Um, you also said that you wrote the novel because of and for Black women and girls. Um, can you talk a bit about how you crafted the story and where you began in terms of character and plot? Mm -hmm. um, well, I've said many times that this the whole identity of Tavia came very instantaneously. I was talking to my sister who lives in Portland and I said, my voice is power, um, which obviously becomes a, a line in the book. And I was talking specifically about the way that black women's voices are so vehemently opposed and the gaslighting that happens when people want you to believe that the reason we're trying to shut you up is because you don't matter. No, the reason you're trying to shut me up is because there's power to my voice and there's power to what I'm saying. We have a very distinct and unique um, social experience, um, not just as black people, but as black women specifically. There is obviously a cross section of oppression and, um, and, injustice that is very specific to black women in this country um that i think can only you know the only comparable experiences that i could think of uh are indigenous women and especially indigenous black women um it, it was definitely when I said my voice is power, I immediately understood that they were sirens and I, I immediately understood that only black women could really claim to be sirens. Um, and it was just such an immediately perfect 
analogy for the way that Black women are treated and why they are treated that way. So instead of this being a story about people who lack power, it immediately is a story about people who are aware that they have power. I am aware that I have power and I understand that's why I'm a threat to you. I understand that that's why I'm in danger. Um, so where I think a lot of YA fantasy starts with someone not knowing who they are and not knowing, this is literally immediately there is an environmental antagonist, which is bigotry and racism and white supremacy and misogynoir, which is directed at you because of your identity, because of your power. So Tavia came very much immediately with that line with the line of my voice is power. And I knew that I wanted it to be in Portland because my experience is in Portland because of Portland taking, you know, the people I'm gonna always judge the harshest are the people who claim to get it. The people who claim they're doing what's right. And then there's no, there's no um, interrogation. There's no asking me if you're doing it right. There's just you telling me you're doing it right. And that's, you know, something that I've, as a child growing up on the West Coast, that happened pretty constantly where people would be like, well, aren't you glad that you live here and not the South? And aren't you lucky that you don't have to deal with the kind of racism? And the interesting thing was, it's a very, um, it's a, I think it's a different kind of sanity assault to be virulently racist and, clearly have the same systems of, systems of oppression and be constantly trying to con, um, condition the person to believe that they're lucky, that they should be grateful, that, you know, so it's while you're oppressing somebody, while you're mistreating somebody, you're constantly telling them what a great person you are. And when we see that in villains on television and in books and stuff, we're always like, oh my gosh, that person is evil. That's the most evil thing. And yet you have the West Coast acting like there's some oasis of progressive uh, morality and everything. And you're like, the only way you can believe that is if my experiences and my voice and my telling of my experience are completely ignored. So um, I knew it was gonna be West Coast, but I knew it was gonna specifically be um, Portland because at the same time, Portland is an extremely white city. It is a very, very small population of non-white people and a, an even smaller population of black people. So. Like I've said a million times, if you find a place in the United States, you know, after this country's been around for as many years as it has, um, this many years outside of enslavement, um, and because we've had Jim Crow, when you find places that are just oppressively white, that are just, you know, just completely white, you have to understand that violence happened. These things don't happen by accident and they're certainly not maintained by accident. So when you start looking at Portland's history and Oregon's history, it was supposed to be a whites only state. I mean, you're talking about actual law that you were supposed to, okay, all of the, okay, now all of the enslaved people, once they're free, which by the way, why would you have basically a slave state all the way on the West Coast and in the North, right? Like, um, anybody who brought black workers with them, they had to be out of Oregon territory by a certain time um, under penalty of any number of things. And obviously uh, sexual violence and, and physical violence are always what ends up happening. And um, so you're talking about a place that has actually written into law that black people were not supposed to exist there that black people were not supposed to be there. So to go to do nothing to reconcile that, to see that you are disproportionately white in this country, as in the city of Portland has a higher white population, you know, relatively speaking, than the country that it's in. For you to do nothing to reconcile any of that and then go immediately from that to, we are so progressive. We are so, we're so good about, you know, moving forward and inclusion and diversity. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, that's ridiculous that you would have the audacity, you know, and then especially my experience being in Portland has routinely been somebody saying to me, isn't it, isn't it like a relief to be here? And I'm like, no, what are you talking about? No, it isn't. Number one, because you keep asking me stuff like that. You're, it's never like, hey, tell me what it's like to be here. The other thing is when you're in Portland and you're a black person, 
people will automatically ask you where you live. Like, do you live in this particular area? And it's pretty much like the quote unquote ghetto of Portland, right? So it's like all of these aggressions that you're constantly experiencing. I wanted people to know black girls already exist in these spaces. They are literally dealing with this while they're trying to be teenagers. They're literally dealing with this while they're trying to go to school. They're literally dealing with this while they're trying to do Ren Faire, while they're trying to have, you know, so there's no such thing as just being a kid when this is constantly a part of your social experience. Um, and the way that I wanted to sort of differentiate between the two girls, because it is extremely important to me that we all metabolize things differently also. And a lot of times as black girls, you're not given that freedom um, because people, I just tweeted about this where it's like black women are gonna save us all and stuff. And all of that just hideously violent rhetoric um, doesn't take into account that we're supposed to be individual people. And some of us have more anxiety than others. And some of us have, so I wanted Effie to be quite different from Tavia. I wanted her, number one, she doesn't know what she is. Um, she has familial mysteries and, and secrets that are being kept from her. And she literally has um, a skin disorder. She's very, very insecure. She's very, very self-conscious all the time. And you cannot expect the same things from her that you can expect from Tavia. Whether you should be expecting them from Tavia or not, you really, if you care enough about Effie, you will recognize that like, there's PTSD here, there's trauma here, there's, you know, so I wanted to, and that was a big part of their relationship is that you get to see that they take care with each other. They take care with each other. They don't put everything that they're experiencing on their sister. Not because I don't need, um, you know, I don't need a place to, to release, but also because I realize that this girl is also another human being and I know she's going through stuff. And is this the best time to put what I'm going through on her when I know she's going through stuff? Just showing black girls radically taking care of black girls, um, even when the rest of the world is failing them, including parents at times, um, and just all of all of the wars that we fight on a daily interpersonal relationship, there is no escape from this except this sisterhood. You know, there's no escape for this but Black women taking care of Black women. Um, so it was really important to me to show them be very different people. Um, and then also to have the character of Naima, who is another Black girl who is also extremely different. Um, I'm very excited because the next book is actually <laughs> Naima's book. Um, I didn't want, I didn't want to create a new black girl archetype. I wanted to open, open people's eyes to the nuance and variety in black girls already. I'm, I'm not just trying to make a new stereotype. So in this book, it's like Effie and Tavia are sort of in a lot of ways, they are the right black girls to sympathize with because you see their trauma you see, number one, you're in their head and they have done nothing wrong that you can see. Um, that's debatable later, which I find very interesting that people don't seem to have a problem with some really problematic stuff that, um, that, that one of them does. But um, the reason I'm telling Naima's story next is because you guys don't get to choose. You don't get to pick and choose which black girl gets to have a story. Like you don't get to pick and choose who, you know, who we have to be to warrant telling our story and showing ourselves and loving ourselves. Naima is sort of radically loves herself um, in a way that even Tavia and Effie don't. So um, I felt like it was really important and because I knew that she would have been villainized by this book. Um, and we are very, we are all for rehabilitating white male villains. Um, we're all, we love doing that. Um, but we've also done it at times with anybody but black women, honestly, I think of Killmonger. Um, and I think of, of, um, oh, Hela, you know, so I think of other villains who the audience is supposed to sort of delight in and sort of love and, and really, you know, you could literally say team Killmonger, despite the fact that he's clearly the villain. And he clearly did some stuff that's completely unforgivable, but a, but a lot of people just ignored the fact that he literally killed black women in that movie. Like, <laughs> He, you know, you can't be like, oh, Killmonger was right. He was right when he shot his girlfriend and killed her. He was right when he grabbed that 
elder black woman and held her up by her throat. Like the violence against black women is not given any sort of um, attention in the rehabilitation of the Killmonger character. And we're supposed to, it's beautifully done, we're supposed to humanize and sympathize with Killmonger, but the way that we're able to rehabilitate villains as long as they're not black girls or black women was why I was like, no, I'm telling Naima's story next because the villain in A Song Below Water is anti-blackness. The villain in A Song Below Water is Massage Noir. It's not a teenage black girl. And I'm seeing so much of people like, oh, I hate Naeem. And I'm like, really? <laughs> okay. Um, where? For what? Why? Um, yeah. Anyway, I've realized I've been answering whatever the question was for a very long time. <laughs> and I don't know how far from it I've gone. <laughs> no, I, I, I love it. I, um, I kind of, I think that's interesting that you want to go and like dive deeper into her, make her more complex than just the foil to Tavia and Effie. That right. she's more than just this character who wants to, I guess, attack them in any way. And I'm well, really and looking forward is, to any sequel. <laughs> the thing that I'm really asking people is, aside from the actual climax of the book, when did she antagonize them? Like what we saw was three high school girls not getting along. But the fact that that, in people's imagination, it was just very easy to get from that to Naima's the bad guy. And I'm like, for not liking these two girls and not doing anything to them and protecting Tavia and being a shield for Tavia, despite that she didn't like her. So I'm like, up until the prom scene, what, what had she done? What had she actually done wrong to them? Um, so I, what, I'm, what I'm really interrogating and, and sort of, I think all of my work will always be an indictment of society intentionally because I'm asking you to recognize that the way that you think about us is violent, that the way that you um, silence us is violent, of course it's an indictment of society. So the, the whole point behind Naima's book is how dare you have have reduced and ignored everything that she did on behalf of Tavia solely because Tavia is a black girl and completely reduce her down to the mean girl, you know, the mean girl at school who deserved what happened to her, which is the problematic thing that I'm like, I have not heard enough people talking about what happens at prom um, and basically how it ends. Um, I don't know if we're allowed, if we're able to do spoilers for this interview, which is why I'm being so vague. <laughs> I was um, like, we could, we could tiptoe around it. Cause in my questions, I was like, I don't want to include spoilers either. Yeah. Um, but, but to have, I mean, but the thing about this book is honestly to have the depth of conversation that I really enjoy having, I realized like, yeah, I would pretty much have to constantly be spoiling stuff um, to talk about the why and to talk about what this, the implications basically of mm -hmm. those things. Um, yeah, so, so that book spawned completely from saying, this is not okay. I, I recognize how often we rehabilitate villains as long as they are from these demographics. And I want to know why it's so easy to demonize black girls, even in a book about black girls. Right. So um, it definitely was like a response to because, you know, early readers and even, you know, my team were like, oh, I hate Naima. And I was like, that's not OK. <laughs> that's not OK. Sorry. Um, it's interesting also when you see books like um, A Ballad of Songbirds and mm -hmm. whatever, yep. um, where the villain who has murdered and been a part of a system that just completely does not care about a whole half of their society is deemed as this forgivable character. It's so interesting that you talk about that. And I want to see when your sequel yeah. comes out, like 100% I, cause I was hugely, about the Hunger Games. Um, I, when I read it, I think I read, I was, I'm always late to stuff, but um, I read it, I read all three of them. 
I didn't like the second book very much because it was very much a second book. And again, I could see the engine running in the author's head and it was like, okay, this is one of those problems when you sell something as a trilogy where you know that the second book can't really be complete. So you've got to insert stuff that in my mind was like completely against the characterization presented. But, um, but I really, I really, really, Mockingjay to me was the best, was absolutely the best book. And um, to have that and to have that sort of legacy, I wrote, I had written an article for tour.com about the experience of watching those movies in the theater and then having the Ferguson uprising happen in between the first and the second movie and expecting this country that had so effusively adored Hunger Games and, and you know, three fingers saluting all the time and doing the whistle all the time and then watching them respond with complete disdain to an actual uprising, to an actual rebellion was like, I mean, I wasn't shocked because I've been black my whole life. I was more, I was really disgusted. And I think the worst possible thing the author could have done to let me know that she too is from Pan Am, just like the rest of my country, is to write a prequel and have it be about a person who becomes a genocidal, you know, fascist leader. Of all the stories, that you could tell, why is it that what fascinates you the most is the story of how this white man became this genocidal? Yeah. Everything doesn't need, every, you know, I, I, it was just, it was, it was galling, but it was like, yeah, you, you are, you wrote this book, but you haven't interrogated who you are and what your country is and how you were socialized. So at the end of the day, you're from the capital. Like you wrote it and you're from the Capitol. That's, you know, and then you kind of have to, we, we sort of knew that when the main character was a white girl to begin with. Um, you guys always don't want to believe that you're going to lead the revolution, but you're also the oppressor. I'm like, <laughs> come on. Um, yeah, that was just, that was beyond disappointing. That was, that was disgusting to me. It was disgusting to me from a publishing standpoint. It was disgusting to me from an artistic standpoint. And of course it was disgusting to me as a citizen of this country. Um, and I absolutely stopped talking about it. As soon as we found out who it was about, I completely stopped talking about it. I completely stopped boosting. I completely stopped uh, referencing it whatsoever. And I have no intention of reading the book, um, which of course then gets you into the well, how can you judge stuff that you haven't read? That is a form of oppression right there. Assuming that the oppressed are unfamiliar with the trappings of oppression, assuming that I need to put myself through that trauma in order to know that it's trauma, my survival depends on being able to see more clearly than somebody who's not at the intersection of all the oppressions I am at. So it's a privilege to be able to say, I'm gonna read this just in case because you are unfamiliar with the constant, uh, with that constant assault, with those constant attacks on both your sanity, your civil rights, your everything, right? So it's, um, it's a disgusting sort of pseudo intellectualism to be like, well, in order to have a dialogue, let's all read all of it. Why cut myself so that I can tell you I bled? I'm, I know already, I already know. Oh, anyway, so that's how I feel about that book. <laughs> yeah, like, personally, I've never read The Hungry Games. I, it didn't have enough representation for me. And it's one of those stories that I see people resonate with. And I'm like, I started reading, one of the first YA books I read was actually The Hate You Give. And I'm mm -hmm. Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter. And those are my why right. pioneers to me oh 100 100 yeah. percent the thing that i the thing that i want people to understand is there should be no canon because at some point you're going to get hopefully if society continues progressing you're going to get to a point where if this came out now i wouldn't even read it absolutely if you told me that you were writing a trilogy about a revolution and the main character and the two love interests were all white i wouldn't even read it because we can't 
afford, we cannot afford that kind of ridiculous right now, ever again, basically. So that's the other reason I am perfectly fine. I mean, the amount of time it's taken certain people to stop with Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. I can't relate. I cannot relate because as soon as I move along in any way, I'm perfectly able to cut something off. I have no regrets about that. Nobody has created anything so mind blowing and so necessary that I have to forgive its creator or I have to forgive the lacking and failing. No, because you know what the whole point of actual inclusion is, is that the next generation can say, well, I started out reading Angie Thomas. So why would I read, why would I be okay with this? If you're not used to an anemic diet of diversity, which is where you keep white people as the center and then you just sort of garnish other people around them. Praise God that that's not normal to you. Like, why would I want people, why would I want younger people to still be like, well, I guess I'll still read this, even though the whole fight has been us doing inclusion correctly and having own voice representation so that we can, so that we can give um, marginalized kids mirrors instead of windows. So why would I want you to go read from outside a window when you have actual mirrors to choose from at this point? Like, yeah, I see nothing wrong with that. I see nothing wrong with people not reading The Hunger Games. You don't need to. There's plenty to read now. That's just more important and will feed you, will actually be some, you know, some sort of sustaining power for you versus, again, reading about somebody else, sort of imagining what would life would be like if they went through what we went through. Yeah. Like if, if, if The Handmaid's Tale came out right now, of course I wouldn't read it. <laughs> Of course I wouldn't. Why would I read that? It's just you saying, what if this happened to us? And I'm like, right, but it already happened to us. Yeah. So why is this a story? Why are you able to get money for writing this when all you're doing is saying, what if we had to go through that? Like, that's not clever. That's ridiculously offensive. No, I'm, I 100% support you never reading a, The Hunger Games. <laughs> Um, to go back to celebrating your novel, um, I wanted to ask you about how the novel was originally set to release, um, later this year, and I'm so happy it came out earlier, um, and it couldn't have been released at a more poignant time considering the Black mm -hmm. Lives Matter protests and everything, mm -hmm. and it's always been relevant. It's always been relevant. But, um, what has been the most rewarding part of publishing A Song Below Water now? And how has it been different than your first novel, Mem? Well, I would say, firstly, the June 2nd was the original publishing date. And then it temporarily got moved to August 4th, I believe, because when COVID first started, everybody was scrambling to be like, how does this work? Like, are people still going to be buying books? Should we? And, and my mind, and actually what, what my team ended up talking about was, since we don't know what this is, and since we don't know how long this is going to last, what is the benefit to pushing it till August when it might still, as we're seeing, it might still be happening in August? So what, you know, so what is the benefit? Um, so thankfully, we, we moved it back to June 2nd, which obviously um, was just a really, really huge launch for, for the book. The difference has to do with a lot of stuff. I mean, the difference between this and Mem can't be understood or can't be overstated because Mem was a literary press release, first of all. It was an adult release. It has ended up finding its way to young adult readers. And a lot of that is because it has been introduced in classrooms, in high school and in university classrooms. So um, it's still, of course, a person at a very transit, like a very transitory moment in their development and their personal development. Um, and that's why I think MEM has worked with young people, uh, despite the fact that of course the concept again is, um, it's an adult market book and it's, it's written for adults, but um, it's very much, it's very much dealing with identity, which I think will always resonate with young people. But um, like I said, it was a, a literary press release and that means that it, the, audience and and the marketing and all of that kind of stuff is is quite different 
Um, young adult is much more sort of blockbuster openings. You know, that's the expectation. People are always looking for, they're looking for the, the next young adult blockbuster. And so it's a much bigger, much more commercial release. The other thing is that um, I write obviously differently when my target audience are young people. So with Mem, which is, I would say, my normal sort of, my most normal voice. Um, and I think people will see it in Sunglow Water too, but I don't spoon feed, I don't spoon feed adults anything, whether it's implications of something, whether it's a moment of characterization, whether it's the concept itself, I don't. It's very much, it's very much written as though you understand. I don't know how to write any other way. If you don't understand, it's perfectly fine and it might not be the book for you, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to do a bunch of exposit, like expository dialogue or, you know, break in my story and the, and the melody and pentameter of my story to be like, okay, here's what's happening and here's what you need to know to understand this. Um, so that's a huge difference because even though for YA, A Song Below Water might still be a bit lyrical and, and um, mysterious in terms of, of course, the world building and just the way that I do things, which is, like I said, that I, I'm not going to write you a map. Um, I still, because my target audience are young people and specifically Black girls, there are things that I'm very clear about. There are conversations that actually happen where they're talking about society and the, the, the role of society in this oppression and all that kind of stuff. Because I am speaking to people who I'm trying to give you, by equal measure, I'm trying to give you the language to defend yourself. Um, and I'm also trying to illuminate for you what is happening to you that you might not that you might not understand why it makes you feel this way um so there's explicit there's an explicitness to my ya that you won't find in my adult work um but so the releases couldn't couldn't have been more different um just you know for those reasons and also because uh, mem wasn't released to a genre audience it was released to a literary audience so um I had to write um, an author's note at the end of Mem to explain to people that I had intentionally left racism out of the book and it was not historical, it was not historically accurate. Um, and then I wrote an essay for the Chicago Review of Books specifically about omitting whiteness, the, the power construct of whiteness from Mem. And I had to write those because of course I wouldn't reference that in the book because it's an adult market book and I'm like I said I'm not going to spoon feed people um, but it was definitely a discussion topic I wanted to have around the book but it's not something that I was willing to belabor the actual story with including um, so I yeah I would say that the biggest difference between my adult and my young adult work is how explicit I am okay um in terms of um I guess explicating your story. Um, when it comes to the reveal of Effie's true form, what influenced the decision of making her, I'm going to include a spoiler, her a Gorgon over what was assumed that she was becoming a mermaid? Well, I knew that before I started writing the book. I knew what she was. Um, she was always going to be that. It's another, it's another mythological creature whose identity is only ever spoken of through the lens of the person who wants to kill her. So if you, because of course the most famous Gorgon is Medusa. So if you think about Medusa, you don't think about Medusa having her own story. You think about mostly the, the journey to kill Medusa. Um, and if you grew up watching Clash of the Titans or whatever, uh, the cleverness of the male hero and, you know, forcing her basically to be responsible for her own death because he shows her her reflection. Um, and it was, it, to me, it is a very, 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 very similar parallel to being a black woman that sirens are and because it's a spoiler i don't get to actually talk about that in any interviews and i'm like this is actually really really important that she's a gorgon 
Um, because think about what you know about Gorgons. It's not a lot. It's basically that they deserve to die. Why do they deserve to die? Who knows? Because she's evil and she's angry. Um, that's like the whole, that's, that's like the extent of what the majority of people just lay people who have just, you know, sort of atmospherically absorbed Greek mythology um, through our lives and through our culture. That's all you know about her. So it was extremely important to me that because of that, because as a reader, I'm expecting that there's a good number of people who are gonna know exactly what she is very quickly um, because her hair moves and you know she's a swimmer and all this other stuff. So it's like the, the whole reason you have to have so many red herrings is because it's kind of obvious what she is. So you have to have her thinking she's a mermaid. You have to have her momentarily being like, oh crap, wait a minute, is Gargi my dad? Am I part gargoyle? You have to have her thinking, oh my God, I might be part Sprite because you have to intentionally sort of distract people away from what is pretty obvious um, Goron traits. Um, but it also speaks to the fact that she wouldn't really necessarily have a lot of, other than thinking of Medusa, and all you can think of as Medusa, again, is a, sort of being a shrew, she wouldn't necessarily have a lot of um, Gorgon mythos in her imagination, just because none of us do. So I kind of am also playing on that, like the, la the exclusion of of Medusa's own story makes it where someone can be turning into a Gorgon and it just never occurs to them that they're turning into a Gorgon. Um, yeah, I, it's, I, to me, it was actually very, very important that she was a Gorgon. I love how kind of Tava and Effie, they're both seen as people that are weaponized and Mm -hmm. They kind of go on their individual journeys and then come back together at the end. And I wrote this in my interview that their bond is like their the most magical part of the book. Yes. And yeah. I really just love that so much. And I think it's interesting that um, Tavia's father is among one of those people who kind of tries to stifle her and silence her. And through the use of ASL, she takes back her voice. And it's sort of a private way for Effie and Tavia to communicate. How did you decide you wanted to include ASL and what factors played into how you wanted to portray the familial relationships? So the first thing, there are three really big, three really big aspects um, that pop out to me in that question. The first one, of course, is Black sisterhood and the necessity and life-saving qualities of Black sisterhood. And we say it explicitly in the book that Black women save Black women and Black women show up for Black women when no one else does. So that in itself, and I have sisters, um, but I also have all of my other sisters, all my other Black girls, and those relationships are absolutely necessary. They are vital to your mental health. Um, it is the only place that you are not, you don't have to perform even a little bit. You don't have to perform calm. You don't have to perform ignorance. You don't have to perform, you know, you don't have to pretend not to see certain things for the benefit of everybody else who's here because it only applies to you. This is also why we talk about dog whistle politics in the book because I want people to understand that this is what's happening to black women all the time. There's always dog whistle politics taking place that your people are saying it right out on front street, but everybody else has the privilege of not, of not knowing that those are attacks specifically on black women. Um, the other thing that's happening is respectability politics, which is obviously what you see emanating from her father. I wanted to deal with the fact that our elders are not infallible and they are not, uh, there's a lot of ancestor and elder appreciation in a lot of cultures, a lot of cultures, um, and that includes black Americans. Um, but the fact of the matter is a, one of the ways that you internalize anti-blackness and that you, when you can't control, when people can kill you at will, which is a unique experience that again, I don't know that people other than indigenous and black Americans have experienced as a fact of constant life, as a fact of our presence 
on this land constantly from beginning to end. Um, when you can just be killed for no reason and no one, and there's no recourse and there's no, um, there's no consequence, you ingest this helplessness and the way that it comes out is you almost try to build these false, this false sense of control. And the way that you do that is, okay, here's what I can do to reduce the chances of this happening. Well, first of all, there's nothing you can do to reduce somebody else's bigotry. It's not your responsibility. It's, it's, ha it's coming from them. It's happening from them. But that is a, that's an untenable feeling of, of, of being out of control. You have to create a formula that if I just do this, then I'll be safer. So, and, and the way that that played out was, you know, black parents being more um, restrictive of black children. So the world is stealing our, our innocence and our childhood. And a lot of times our own families were stealing that because we didn't get to play outside and laugh or be too loud. You don't get to make noise in class because you could end up being sent to juvenile hall. You know, out of a desire to protect, a lot of times um, the community and the elders in the community have applied these really impossible restrictions and in a way then turn it into, well, it's your fault because you didn't pull your pants up, because you didn't talk like you had some sins, because you didn't, and you find all of these ways that in trying to take control um, of your welfare and safety, which you have to just acknowledge is not your responsibility. This is actually violence from coming from someone else. The ingestion of that means that you actually then begin to blame the victim. There's a reason that black people also will say stuff like, well, black on black crime. Well, we have to start taking better care of ourselves. Like, baby, what are you talking about? How would you take systemic, intentional, consistent murder of our people and instead of holding the oppressor responsible, you've decided that the right thing to do is say, well, we have to start killing each other. What are you talking about? Every race is more likely to kill within their own race. Those are just homicide stats. The fact that we made a black on black crime is itself an anti-black racist invention. It's a myth. We do not kill each other more often than other people kill each other. We don't. It's just statistically not true. Um, but that is one of the results of this, um, of this respectability politics. And you see it really, really clearly in Tavia's father. Um, he is constantly trying to hold her accountable for her own safety because he feels so out of control. And I wanted to show it, and it's obviously coming from someone who loves you, but show that it is 100% wrong. Like show that it is 100% damaging. Um, I didn't want to make it about like, oh, I have to understand where he's coming from. Absolutely not. This is wrong. This is completely wrong. This is hurtful and it's damaging and it's traumatizing. And it also steals the comfort that you're supposed to get in the family home because he's just always chastising her. Um, and then the last thing, let's see, what was the last thing that I wanted to say? There was the, there was the sisterhood. There was the respectability politics. Oh, it took too long to get to the last one. What was it? Oh, well, now I can't remember. Can you say the last part of your question? Um, what was, how did you, what factors played into how you wanted to portray the familial relationships and how did you decide to include ASL? ASL, yes. So, um, there's a couple of things in this book that were just things that I was just fascinated with and adored when I was younger, and that was Ren Faire and ASL. Um, I never went to AS, I never went to Ren Faire because um, I just knew I was in mostly white spaces whenever I wasn't at a particular church or in my actual neighborhood, and I just wasn't willing to add a third. You know, I wasn't I wasn't willing to add another place where I knew and had to be constantly aware that my presence was unwanted. So I like, we followed, we knew when the Red Fair came every year, we, you know, I saw commercials for it. I looked up, you know, all of the, all of that sort of um, the clothing and everything. I was really, really obsessed with it, but I, I never did it. I never went because I was like, why? Why, why intentionally go through this when I'm already going through this all the time? And that really pisses me off that, that 
not that I didn't go. I'm not mad at my teenage self for not going. I'm mad that I knew it. Like I knew it would be a problem for me to go. Um, and again, I was in California. So <laughs> whatever people think that's like, it's not. Um, ASL was a similar obsession that I had when I was younger. Um, and the thing that really bothered me, I always knew someone who spoke ASL. And the thing that always bothered me is the only reason they spoke it was because someone in their immediate family was deaf or hard of hearing. And I was like, this doesn't really seem fair because it's a, it's a whole language. Like it's a beautiful language and I can't find anywhere that will let me take classes because I'm from a hearing family. Um, and the only time we teach, because everybody who has a baby, uh, you, I don't know anybody who, who doesn't have baby videos and uh, when, anytime they do all the different languages, ASL is always a part of it. You always teach toddlers to, to use certain things like this or this, you know, you, that's just a normal thing to teach your baby because your baby can't talk, right? And then when your baby starts to pick up language, you just completely abandon that. And I'm like, how disrespectful, like that's, <laughs> that's so sort of ridiculous. The other thing is, it's almost like my society just decided that I shouldn't have any connection with the deaf and hard of hearing community. Because you, like, you have an entire segment of your population that we just decided it's perfectly fine if we can't communicate with you. What? Like, that's, that's so weird to me. That is wild to me. Um, and then, of course, as soon as you start studying sociology, you have a lot of nonverbal communication classes, you have language and cognition classes and everything. And it, and it made me want to learn it all over again because I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, this is a huge, there, there is so much that we are missing out on from an entire segment of our population, not knowing, not pursuing their thoughts and their beliefs and their critiques and their, you know, like th that to me just didn't make any sense. How do you have a social science discipline and you have very, very limited exposure to scholars from that community and you somehow think that you're possibly representing them like it just it doesn't make any sense um so i wanted it, it upset me in the way of uh detaching us from a whole group of our country people um and it upset me because it's also a beautiful language like any other second language that i could freely choose to study in junior high and high school so i wanted the girls to come to it from completely different origins um effie learns it as a language. Effie learns it as this is a part of the world that I'm in. Um, this is the way that the mermaids communicate. And it's a, you know, it's a part of my fantastical life. And it's just this beautiful, there's no trauma in, you know, for her associated with it. It's just the beauty of ASL. And for Tavia, it's sort of life-saving. And it is literally, I depend on this. I need this. This is my actual voice this is my actual language um so i didn't want to i didn't want to cast it with that sort of and i'm sure that you know again because i have very limited exposure um to the community for whom it is their native their native language um i really wouldn't be able to know what I needed to do better or differently. I know that we looked for sensitivity reading for that. And I have gotten feedback um, from ASL teachers. And for the most part, the sad thing is exclusively, they haven't even, they haven't even dealt with, you know, the fact that I don't give any sort of like specific signing in the book, except for the time that I say that she signed this basically incorrectly, she signed this the way that she would do this to a dog or, you know, to an animal versus to another human being. But they have all just been shocked that ASL is in a book, period. And have, you know, have expressed like, I'm so excited to share this with my kids because these two, because both of the main characters speak ASL. And it's literally, I think for some people, it's literally just representation. Yeah. Um. For me personally, I learned ASL because I saw within my own family that 
deaf and hard of hearing people are disproportionately seen in like educational spaces and mm -hmm. even in the classroom it's harder for them to communicate and they end up dropping the class in general right. and I was just amazed that it was in a book and I was like wow I love that they're using it as a communication because I use it to communicate with my sister to mm -hmm. within spaces that we can't speak or we're yeah. far away from each other and I yeah. like how you kind of course correct with teaching um, young readers that they don't need to apologize for who they are. They can be interested mm -hmm. in things that are seen as white things. They can be, mm -hmm. they can be multifaceted in ways that aren't defined by their race. Mm -hmm. And um, I really like how you call out victim blaming, anti-black Liz, and even by non-black people of color. And even the statement how black lives can't matter until siren lives do speaks volumes. Yeah. And um, how did you find a balance between um, Oh, my computer went out. <laughs> Sorry. Um, how did you find a balance between confronting all these issues while writing in the scope of fantasy or magical realism? To me, the reason it's so important to have Black women and marginalized people uh, Again, um, my my passion is really like when I speak, it shouldn't be seen as the exclusion of others, but literally I think the reason it's so important to have indigenous women and black women um, telling our own stories is we don't have to find a balance. This is literally my reality. Um, you know, people are like, how do you, how do you juggle? And I'm like, because I live it. <laughs> Um, it's seriously, it's the double and triple consciousness, right? So sirens are, are the story of sirens in this book are black women. It's the story of, of black women. And, and in a lot of ways, it's very much speaking also to the experience of black trans women and the way that the world and the community and even other black women will treat black trans women. So I don't have to, fantasy for me is allowing me to elevate something that, that should be obvious, but that people pretend they don't see, and also alleviates from me the necessity to, to um, I guess, carry that emotional burden of knowing that I'm only writing about contemporary things. There is a certain burden that that carries that I don't think is fair both to the black girl reader or to the black girl writer. Now, obviously there are plenty of black women who write contemporary and they are doing it beautifully. That is not my ministry. I am always going to use speculative aspects to, because I think that it is easier for people to use, for people to have fantasy in their imagination than black women in their imagination. It is actually easier to get, and that's why you see this sort of like allegorical bigotry all the time where people say that they're talking about race, but they're dealing with it in terms of orcs and fairies and stuff. And the reason that's offensive is A, you're ignoring that this is real, but B, because you're literally saying these things have a, have a higher priority and place in your imagination than I do, because this is happening to me in the real world and you're refusing to believe it. So I don't, I use it, I use fantasy and I use it in completely in line with reality in terms of, I'm not making just everybody sirens. I'm not, you know what I mean? I'm not making just anybody the Gorgon. I'm literally using it to elevate the message that I'm saying specifically about this real life oppressed identity. Um, and therefore, like I said, I'm not, I'm not having to learn how to juggle or balance something. I'm literally telling you what my lived experience is. I'm literally telling you what I go through on a constant basis. There's a level of craft and a level of awareness and knowledge that is quote unquote privilege. It's, just, it's not an actual privilege, but it's literally someone else doesn't know this. If I don't tell you, you're not going to know this. So that is why it is so important to me to have representation versus diversity. I don't just want a bunch of white authors, including black kids in their stories, because those are not ever going to be that black child story. 
Um, it's extremely important to me that we are telling it because I know something you don't know. If I might use fantasy to elevate it, to bring it to the surface for you, but this is real. What I'm talking about is reality. So I don't know if that, that answered that well, but um, yeah, I just, I think that people don't understand how paramount it is to give marginalized women the space to tell our own stories. I love that. I love that you aren't saying I'm going to put myself in the space of fantasy. I'm going to use fantasy to uplift what I already am wanting to do. And that's yeah. what I, um, what attracted me so much to this book because I don't, fantasy is another thing I don't really read because it doesn't represent the people that right. I see in my everyday. And right. I don't enjoy that. And so um, with that said, going back to the representation of sirens, did you assign with any um, specificity who was going to portray the other magical creatures such as the Ilocos? No, so with the, well, I guess yes with the Oloko because I was intentionally introducing, the thing about fantasy and part of what you just now said is I was not coming to fantasy, I'm bringing fantasy to me. Um, mm -hmm. So I was not going to use even the mythological creatures that you see that pretty much follow what you might know from their origin, which is never true because we like to erase the parts we actually first got from like Asia and African places, but that's fine. Um, by which I mean, it's not fine at all. Um, so there were some people that was like, this is going to be, sprites are gonna be sort of what you would expect from Fae people. And they're not human, right? So they're, they're no race in particular at all. Um, gargoyles, again, this is gonna be a spoiler. Um, gargoyles would basically be choosing how they wanted to represent themselves in terms of the human appearance because their original appearance is of stone their their actual their actual identity is the stone so again i just feel like i have to say this is about to be a spoiler in case anybody doesn't <laughs> want to hear this um so gargi being wallace and wallace being latinx is because that's what he wanted that's who he wanted to be. That's what he, that's what he was attracted to. So um, his original identity is, is this stone behemoth that is carved out of stone. So he's not actually a human and therefore his human form is up to him. Um, but then with a loco, I was intentionally bringing in a central African folklore because I wasn't going to just stick to the fantasy that's been shoved down our throats as though this is like the beginning and end of fantasy. Um, I was not going to exclude, you know, the continent from which I am a diaspora um, in order to keep it Eurocentric. I was intentionally displacing all of the Eurocentric ideology. So Gorgons, of course, being black and, and um, Sirens being black and then mermaids being probably South American or, or Asian or Southeast Asian or, um, or African because of where they tend to spawn, which is under the, uh, under the equator. So I was pretty much always disrupting the sort of European assumption of fantasy. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to be able to play with it because the problem with the lack of representation is that everybody treats your work like it's supposed to be educational. Like, since I have never seen this before, you have to tell me the truth about this. No, I don't. <laughs> like, that's, you have Google. So it's like, you know, you can play with sirens as much as you want. You can play with mermaids as much as you want. But we've never seen a loco, which of course, it, when you pluralize them and the, the actual accurate way to pluralize them would be Beloco. So I'm also demonstrating that I am intentionally, I'm intentionally um, fictionalizing and changing this. And it speaks to my identity as a diaspora, as a member of the, of the black diaspora, which is this telephone effect of, if I'm a black American girl from the West Coast, all the way on the West Coast, how many different ways might this mythos have been altered or changed or misunderstood or miscommunicated 
by the time it gets to me, right? So what's supposed to be Boloco becomes a loco. What's supposed to be sort of diminutive, diminutive, cannibalistic, malevolent um, beings becomes pretty much there's no physical attribute to it. It's anybody, but they're beloved and they're charming. And yes, they have that. The only thing that you really keep the same is the ancestral spirit aspect of it. Um, and the reason that they are so loved, I also had already decided that I was going to make the non-European origin um, fantastical creature. I was going to make them the talk of the food chain because it's my book and I said so. So, um, so I make them the top of the food chain, but I also make them, one of the easiest ways to make something attractive to white people is to give them access to it, right? Um, so the reason you hate mermaids isn't that only black people, or sirens, isn't that only black people can be sirens, it's that white people can't be. Because whiteness is not a heritage, whiteness is a power conglomeration, and therefore it is by nature exclusionary, it depends on being able to exclude people. It depends on subjugating someone else. You are not white if someone else is not black. There's, right, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an identity that is formed entirely in contrast to someone else. And that's why it's so flimsy um, because it, it really it was only created so that you could say these other people are the opposite of us and therefore are beneath us. Um, so they don't, they didn't, they don't dislike mermaids. And, I, and the, the funny thing is, I'm sorry, I keep saying mermaids because people always say mermaids with this book. And I'm always like, it's a spoiler if I tell you she's not a mermaid, but, <laughs> but I always say siren because that's, that's what is actually accurate in the book. Um, I've had quite a few people, white readers, be like, well, I guess I just didn't understand why only black women could be sirens. And I'm like, you're literally a character in my book right now. Like you're, you're actually saying the exact thing I'm, I'm indicting. That's wild to me that you're like literally saying that. Um, because they're so uncomfortable with black people having anything. Like they're so uncomfortable with it. It's, it's just, it's just a, it's in a constantly consuming and a constantly greedy sort of um, identity, which is why I, you know, I say we have to abolish whiteness and we have to start by explaining that whiteness is not a heritage. It has no heritage. It has no country of origin. It is solely there to subjugate. So um, I made a loco the top of the food chain easily, which is just by making white people able to be it. And just by doing that, it doesn't matter that their mythos is literally cannibals. Like it doesn't matter that their origin is literally like these are people who are constantly trying. These are fantastical creatures that according to legend are, are always trying to harm and kill you. It doesn't matter because as soon as you give them access to it, now these are the most beloved. Of course, nobody believes that they're cannibals. Of course, nobody believes, you know, you can completely, it's, it's basically I'm talking about the mythology of mythology. You can, anybody's, Mythology can be redeemed as long as it's the right person. And that's the whole thing about Naima again, right? Um, it's demonstrating that there's nothing so bad that we can't rehabilitate it if we choose to rehabilitate it. So we'll act like sirens are, this is understandable. Of course we're afraid of sirens. Of course they're dangerous. Of course we should collar them because look what they could do to us if they wanted to. And then at the under, other end of the spectrum, you have a loco um they could eat you i don't the legend is that that's what they did so so why are they safe because you have access to it because it could be you so you've made it desirable um so it was important to me that a loco could be not just anyone but of course could that white people could be a loco um and that's pretty much the only thing in the book other than maybe giants because we don't really talk about we say that miss fish the teacher um, has giants in her in her lineage now from what you know of miss fish who knows if that's even true but the <laughs> point is um if, if she if she can say that obviously it means that that her family could um have giants in their history so um we we never say who oracles were except women so um i think of oracles as being any woman and I think of giants as being anyone. Um, but these are people that have either become reclusive, 
because of how uncomfortable it is to try to live in a world alongside people like us who immediately make our world outfitted for our dimensions <laughs> to the exclusion of literally anybody else. Um, so whether they were liked or disliked or who knows, the point is they don't fit. They don't fit in the world that we've created. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess I did think pretty, I, did, I guess the way that I feel is that I didn't sort of plan that stuff. It just sort of sociologically made sense to me that those, that that would be the case for these other ones, if that makes sense. Yeah. I like that you, you make clear and you reinforce that like white is not the default. That right. Black people can be anything. They can be in any space. And I just, <laughs> um, so reading about Rhoda Taylor and how she was treated by the media, I was immediately reminded of Breonna Taylor and how her treatment was in comparison to George Floyd. Um, which and is was it not heartbreaking on. that they had the same last name? Yeah, I was, I didn't even know how to respond because I was like, this is insane. That knocked the wind out of me. That yeah. definitely knocked the wind out of me because obviously this book was written in 2017. Um, and I just, it was, it was too fine a point, honestly. It was like, I know this stuff never ends, but like, seriously, the same last name, like. It was devastating. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's interesting how like you, you say you wrote this in 2017 and everything you wrote about is just so on point with everything that's going on. And I just want to take this, this time to just praise you because your writing is phenomenal and you, you write so definitively um and i can't i can't wait to read more um you not only make a stand on injustice but you celebrate black women just as much as you discuss their struggles mm -hmm. um i especially love how chavi and effie indulge in their hair tutorials and especially from the character Camilla Fox. Because she's a YouTuber, how valuable do you think social media is for teens when it comes to self-worth and social change? I think it's as important for them as it is for everyone else. And the reason we don't have to discuss it is because everyone else has always had access to it. So it's, it's why it's so interesting that as soon as you change a character's race or gender, the person, who, the person who's the loudest about being upset about that is the person who has always been represented. So think about Captain Marvel and, um, you know, think about Valkyrie and think about any of the characters that were race or gender bent. And the people who have the most on their plate were always the first and are always the first to be upset about it. You are used to a 100% saturation of representation. And then you're claiming that you don't understand why it would be important for us to have any. Well, if you get this upset over losing a single, and this is the thing about the greed of, of whiteness as a power construct, you expect 100% representation. Why would you expect that if it wasn't powerful? Why would you be so angry at losing even a fraction of it if you didn't understand its power? So we are constantly asked to define and describe why we need representation. And that's a completely backwards question. I completely understand why we do it, but it's completely backward. Why would you ask the people who don't have these mirrors why mirrors are important? Why don't you ask the person who has hoarded all of the mirrors? You tell me why this is so important. Because you know it is, you must know it is, because you keep erecting them. And you've intentionally kept the rest of us without them. So you tell me why this is so necessary. Why do your kids need to see themselves everywhere? Why do your kids need to be every superhero? You know, you know the answer or you wouldn't be doing it, right? So I, re I feel like we have to start confronting and indicting the power dominant classes and races and you know social tiers because if not we're constantly asked to give 
a justification for our existence. Why do you need to exist? Why do you need to be present? Why do you have to be here? Like, what kind of question is that? Why would, why should we even have to answer? You're asking us to give an answer for our dignity, to give an answer for our right to exist. Ask why these people have taken up so much space. When it comes to um, the idea of mirrors, I always mm -hmm. think back to Rudine Sims Bishop's um, statement about sliding doors and windows, and that has kind of guided me through what I want to read mm -hmm. and how I want to present books to my younger family members, to the young people I interact with. And I think that's interesting to think about because we are force fed white characters throughout our lives and reflecting back I always remember looking up to the um, unidentifiable brown and black girls because right. those were the only people yes. I could resonate with. And, and they now, intentionally make them ambiguous. They intentionally yeah. made them ambiguous. So you don't, you can't get really full on it. Yes. Because it doesn't quite represent you, but the whole point is it's not white. Mm -hmm. Um, so going to your second novel, can you give any more details about Naima's story? So what I think I can say about Naima's story is it's not a sequel, but it chronologically follows this book. So since we've given other spoilers, I feel like it's maybe okay to talk about what happens at the end of A Song Below Water. Um, and the reason that I really thought people would realize that this is much more nuanced and complicated than saying, hey, this teenage girl is, a, is the villain. Tavia doesn't just turn Naima to stone. She compels her sister to turn Naima to stone. She takes away her sister's agency because she's more concerned at this moment with revenge, even though the weight of responsibility could ultimately fall on Effie because she's the one who actually, whose magic is actually being used. So basically, you know, people talk about how they're ready for realistic black girl characters and stuff. And I'm like, A, I think that people, people haven't been treating Naima like she's a child, which isn't fair because she's a child. <laughs> she's in high school, just like Tavia and Evie. And if she's a child, were you okay with her being intentionally set in stone before we ever knew that there was a way out? Because at the time that they do it, the time that Tavia makes Effie do it, she thinks it's a death sentence, basically. There's something really wrong with that. There's something very wrong with that. So Naima is, is actually the best of these characters to be angry because Naima is very self-aware and she is very fond of herself in a way that if somebody asked, you know, which of your characters take after you the most, it's Naima. Like I 100% relate to Naima more than all of my other teenage characters because I had basically an unwieldy and unattractive amount of self-esteem and confidence. And you weren't going to change my mind about it because it didn't come from you. It didn't rely on you. It did, you know what I mean? So, um, so Naima's story begins after, actually I think it's a year after um, prom. So she has gone through this experience but she also sort of wakes up to a new Portland because again, it's another indictment of society. We only have space for so many black women that we can like. So Naima was pretty much the top of the food chain in the first book because she's a loco. And I'm sorry, pardon me. Um, let's just say when she wakes up, the world is different. 
when she comes out of the stone, the world is different. The other thing is that I did do a location change for her. So she ends up, I don't know if I explicitly say it in the book, but she's in, um, she's in Arizona <laughs> when she, right? <laughs> so yes. I'm like, that was for you. Um, <laughs> So she, yeah, so she has a, and you have to think about why somebody like Naima would, would be outside of Portland because Portland is the Aloka hotbed and Portland is basically the center of her universe. Um, so I think that's what I can probably get away with saying is that she's angry. She wakes up to a, to a new sort of existence and she leaves Portland for, you know, a time period. She's not, she's not like relocating or something, but she's leaving. And that in itself is significant because she's in the local. Um, but I'm so, I, I cannot wait. I cannot wait for people to read it. I hope that we're able to have, you know, I hope this radicalization that a lot of people have experienced this summer, I hope that they realize they can't go back. There's no going back from this. Um, you can't, these aren't things that you can know and then unknow. So I hope that that also means that we're gonna be progressing the conversation because we've had to stay in a sort of 101 style conversation for a really long time, an embarrassingly long time, an infuriatingly long time. And all of my work is always going to be pushing the conversation further and demanding more of the person who claims they either get it or want to get it. Um, and I think that that's what Naima's story does because it looks at the way society tries to pivot instead of, I mean, it's going to seem timely too, I guess. Um, this is why, this is why I'm like, are black women just oracles? Let's see. Um, but the way that society tries to pivot instead of really, instead of really taking accountability for their role in the previous world order, now we're just going to pivot and, and now we love you. Okay, well, what about the person you used to love? And how do you, how is this genuine if it's just sort of um, interchangeable? And if you don't have, you don't seem to have space for more than one. Um, yeah, so that's what her story is about. I think it's, I think, I mean, I, I wish it could come out even sooner because I feel like it's a discussion we need to, I feel like it's a discussion we need to be having right now. Um, but I'm also releasing next year um, my Little Women remix. So I'm very, I will have two releases coming next year. Um, I believe Naima should be, and that one is going to be called A Chorus Rises. Um, I believe that comes out in June around the same time as A Song of the Water. And then my Little Women remix will come out, I think, in October. That was also my next question about Little Women, because I'm so excited. Um, what is it like to reclaim such a classic? Well, I actually, this is funny. So, of course, I've had a lot of racists and bigots and stuff um, trying to do gotcha moments or whatever. And somebody actually echoed something I had already told to my editor as though they were like putting me in my place. And I was like, joke's on you. I already agree with you. Um, because I was like, I'm not reclaiming anything. It's not mine. It was never mine. I was excluded. Right. So I said, because of course the publisher came up with the, uh, the series title, which was reclaimed classics. And I speaking to the other authors were like, it's not reclaiming. We're, we're literally doing this because we were excluded. You can only reclaim something that was yours to begin with, right? So I have always called mine a remix. Well, thankfully, now the publisher is changing the title of the series and it's going to be remixed classics, I think. Um, so I'm very, very excited about that because I feel like that is way more accurate. Um, I think it's very important to hold these original works responsible for the exclusions. Um, particularly in something like Little Women, where you claim that this family is like abolitionists, but, but there's no black people in the book. Like there's, <laughs> like you're abolitionists and it's just, a, it's just sort of a virtue signal to say, these are the good white people. Um, but they never have to prove it. You never have to see them engage 
with black liberation, you never, you know what I mean? Like they never have to do anything to earn that title. Um, so it was amazing because number one, I don't know if I've ever read the first book all the way through because it's not a very interesting book to me. And my love is based on the 1994 movie with Winona Ryder. Um, so I already told the publisher, like, if I do this, it's it, at the very most, it would be like a remix of the, of the adaptation. Um, which they were perfectly fine with. But then the thing is that race is not skin deep, particularly those of us who have come through chattel slavery. Um, the color of your skin and your identity had a huge impact on literally your physical safety, your ability to vote, your ability to move around the country, all that kind of stuff. So my book is set in 1863. So when the Civil War is still occurring um, and it's set in... North Carolina on Roanoke Island, which is where a free person's colony, it's, at the time it's called a freedman's colony. I, I call it free people's colony. Um, and it's basically about the March family as having recently emancipated themselves really, because when, this, when these battles were happening um, along the Outer Banks or inland of North Carolina and stuff, um, because a lot of people were fleeing, a lot of a lot of Southern white people were fleeing and sort of abandoning property and stuff. Um, right before that, the family just walks off because they're like, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and wait and see if you, you know, what's going on with you. Um, if I know the union is nearby, I'm just going to leave. So these freed people colonies arose near basically union encampments, wherever the the army was that's where the freed either the, either the freed or just walked away um black people would would go and congregate so this is a pretty famous um one of the most famous freed people colonies that was expected to be you know a permanent and it was supposed to be the great american experiment of what life could be like for black americans following enslavement um, and so the, the book starts there. It's the four sisters. The other thing is like, sorry, these names don't really work for black families at the time. So, um, so one thing that I did was the father's name is uh, obviously a, a tribute to Louisa May Alcott. So his name is Alcott March. Um, and then the mother's name is still Margaret, but Meg is just Meg. It's not short for anything. Um, Josephine is Joanna. Um, Beth is Bethlehem because there's no way that you weren't going to have a biblical name in a black family. Like it's just, it's not accurate. <laughs> so Beth became Bethlehem and Amy became Amethyst. Um, so there immediately it was like, Oh, this is not a retelling at all. There's literally nothing similar about these books because how could they be your life as a white American in 1863 would have no, I mean, it would be night and day, it'd be worlds apart. There are, there's no crossover between their lives and the March sisters as black women. So there is a time jump also in mine. And so the part of, part of their journey for some of them is also in Boston. Um, but basically I follow the rule of, okay, if you're going to do sort of like a remix, you well, you do what a remix does. Here are the elements that let you know what the source material is. And as long as those elements are present, you realize that this is a Little Women remix. But in terms of like storylines and plotting and all that kind of stuff being similar and characterization even being similar, it's not. So you have the sisters, of course. Um, you know, you have Amy being a quite dramatic, <laughs> a quite dramatic character. Joe is a writer. Um, and then you have a type of Lori. Um, it's spelled differently. It's, the, you know, it's a different character. Um, I wasn't really fond of the original Lori, to be honest. Um, so you have, because you have Lori and you have the four sisters, anybody who sees it knows that this is a Little Women book, but it's not Little Women. I'm just so excited. You could literally write it on a paper napkin and <laughs> um, 
So last question, um, what books would you recommend for readers after they've completed your book? Oh gosh, okay, so if you like a song of the water. This is going to be bad because one of these has not come out yet. And I realize that that's not fair to people. But if you like contemporary fantasy, I really, really, really cannot wait for people to have access to Tracy Dion's Legendborn, which is coming out in <laughs> September. And oh my goodness. Um, she, I would say, if, if I could say this person does, this person is doing with their book what I'm doing with the song below water in terms of just the the weight that is carrying just the the work that is accomplished um in terms of fantasy in terms of characterization in terms of commentary social indictment all of that stuff absolutely absolutely legend born um i personally if you like atmospheric stuff okay this one is like people should have already read because the bells came out a while ago at this point but um i think that the bells is another beautiful super duper rich fantasy that casts a black girl in a in a situation and in a in a world where you can very easily see and understand um the way that this is used against us in the real world um the things that we go through especially with it being so obsessed with beauty and the right way to be beautiful and especially to have the main character be a black girl and to be the only black girl who is a bell um, at the time. So I really, really love that kind of fantasy because it is still very much, it's not contemporary fantasy by any stretch of the imagination, but it very much draws on our world. Um, there are no fantastical creatures in it though. Um, if you are reading, is this only for young adult? I feel like our readers are adult and you can recommend anything you like. I think that it is super duper important right now, especially right now. I really want people to be reading Tochi Onyabuchi's Riot Baby, um, which is a novella. It was his first adult market. Um, he also wrote War Girls. Um, I just, it was, it was, it's almost too personal of a reading experience to really be able to express. It goes from um, the West Coast to the East Coast, this Black family, this, this young boy who is literally born during the, riot, uh, the riots after the Rodney King acquittals the um, police officers who beat Rodney King and were videotaped and then were acquitted in court, which led to the, you know, the famous, and this is my childhood. So reading it and having, having a character literally be born out of that anger and born in the, it's just so, it was, it was exactly what I needed when I read it. It was exactly what I needed. I don't know that any other any other work would have let me get out what I needed to get out or get through what I needed to get through and a particularly having a brother who's incarcerated because um, it's a brother and a sister and she begins to express these powers, these extremely strong powers um, and he goes down a very familiar path, which we have to realize is it's like set out before um, black children and brown children, to be honest. And, um, and so seeing, it's almost like, it almost feels like an origin story, which you'll understand after you read it. It almost feels like an origin story of, you know, of something that I wish would just be a huge long running series. Um, on television especially, I would love, I would love to see it, but it, it just, it dealt with so much of what we deal with. And again, uses speculative elements to elevate those things um, in your mind. And people, you know, I've heard people call it dystopian, which is really strange because everything that he's describing, and again, I say this as somebody who has an incarcerated sibling, everything that he's describing, I'm like, they're already doing this they've already done this. Like they're already doing this to us, you guys. Like how is this, it, it's, it's always telling what white people will call dystopian. Yes. 
because I'm like, well, is it dystopian if we're already experiencing it? Um, yeah, so that is probably, if I'm being very honest, that is probably my highest recommendation, even if they're, they are young people, because I think, I think it's, I think it's an absolutely necessary, I think it's an, it should be required reading. Thank you so much. I got so much out of this interview. It was a wonderful experience. Um, and also happy belated birthday. Thank you. I hope you had a good day. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. I had a great time.